Ain't No Mountain High Enough by Lisa Wentworth. There once was a girl called Lydia. She was pretty and sweet, but not the prettiest and sweetest. She was smart and clever, but not the smartest or most clever. She never won awards for her work in class. She was fit and active and loved being outside, but she never excelled and got blue ribbons at contests. She preferred to just challenge herself. In fact, Lydia was quite content in her own little world. It was a beautiful place. She dreamed of mountains and seas and blue skies and birds that she chatted with would land on her finger and sing to her in her world. It was a magical place. But every once in a while, Lydia longed for the prizes and good grades her classmates would win. It didn't seem fair, as she certainly tried hard, that she never got the accolades she so wanted and deserved. During recess, while the other kids screamed and yelled on the playground equipment, Lydia would go off in her world in the fresh air. She was quiet and didn't like yelling or screaming. It seemed so immature and counterproductive. Girls would hang upside down and show off, but the monkey bars only gave Lydia blisters. She couldn't see the point. Boys would throw balls and hit each other, and occasionally an errand one would hit her. Lydia didn't like being hit by things. In fact, because she was sweet and quiet, boys would bang into her, throw paper wads in her curly locks, or spill things on her during lunchtime. Her mother told her that's how boys show they like you and want your attention. Lydia thought this a ludicrous way of getting it. Why not just say hello? Seemed to make a lot more sense. Lydia was usually lost in her beautiful world singing songs back to the birds, but she wouldn't mind sharing it, or because it could be quite lonely. She wouldn't mind being invited to play with the other kids, but being hit seemed more an insult than an invite to her. Besides, the bigger, meaner girls in class would do similar things, drag her by her neck in the classroom when no one was looking, stuff her into a stack of tires so she couldn't get out. Her mother told her that's because they wanted her to be their friend. Lydia thought that being dragged around by force was a funny way of showing that. Nothing ever happened to these kids as punishment. In fact, most of the red and blue ribbons were handed out to this La Come Game Day. So they were rewarded for being bigger and stronger. It seemed patently unfair to Lydia, so she just watched from the sidelines in her little world. It was a safe place to be. Lydia's mother sensed her daughter's frustration and decided to enroll her in something she could excel in. Since she was graceful and loved to dance around the garden, she thought ballet would be a good fit. It wasn't a team sport. There were no balls flying apart. It was silent so no screaming, and it was a magical activity. Since she was pretty and sweet, she fit the part. In the large mirrored studio, Lydia was lost in a bigger world she could see reflected in the glass. Her blue leotard was the only thing she could see, and squinted so she looked like a bird in her mind with her curls up to look like a crown of gold like her feathered friends in her world. The other girls didn't matter. She couldn't even tell you what they looked like. Lydia was very good at following directions, something she never got awards for in class. So she loved learning the new French words for dance steps and shaped her body best she could to conform to them. During floor exercises, out in the center of the room, Lydia saw the mountains and the rivers and seas. She saw the birds that sang and danced in tune with the classical music. Ballet clearly placed her directly in the world in which she lived. For her first recital, her dance teacher did a very simplified version of Swan Lake. Lydia loved it. Dressed in a white tutu with a feather headdress, she felt like the beautiful birds she saw in the rivers below the mountains in her world. Sure, they didn't sing, but they moved with the grace of a ballerina. Lydia's mom bought the record to practice the dance to the music at home, and practice she did. She had a long mirror in her room, 
and danced and tried to be as perfect as her young self could be. Come the recital, Lydia danced her heart out. She continued with ballet for a few more years, but the bullying at school got worse. Lydia now had something she loved to do. She was already tiny, but now with her straight posture, the kids assumed she was being aloof. They really picked on her, so she decided to be a tomboy and drop out of ballet around the fourth grade. She changed from wearing pretty dresses and now wanted to sleep in her brother's bunk bed and play with his toys. It seemed being tougher was the only salvation for her at school. Her parents went along with this for a year or so, but they realized there was something wrong. Her mother asked around, and a friend of hers at the bank had a daughter that was a former ballerina. She had trained with a Russian ballet master and started teaching, so her mother enrolled her there. It was a more disciplined environment. Lydia did well following a more strict dress code and curriculum. She focused more on technique and getting more advanced. She no longer wandered into her world. She learned to stay in the moment. Besides, by now the music told her the story or world she was living in at that moment. Some dark, some light, some heavy and slow, some quick and jovial. She learned her world could be more diverse, more beautiful and rich based on the music and mood of the dance. This was a performing company, and Lydia rose quickly through the ranks so she could perform as many different types of roles at as many different venues as possible. Even though the ballet world changed Lydia's purpose and drive, nothing changed at school. Because of the way she now carried herself and her slim build, the kids now thought she was stuck up. They bullied and picked on her. She was never picked to join teams, sit next to kids at lunch, or be a part of anything. By the time she was about to enter, Lydia was having downright panic attacks about this. She didn't want to be hurt by the kids and endanger her dance career. It was Lydia herself that wrote the school district about the bullying and took her learner's permit with her mother in tow to explain her case. Her mother had always pleaded with teachers and thought that's all she could do, and they said Lydia would grow out of her dreamy state and they would keep an eye out for her, but she still was picked on. Meantime, her mother had made arrangements with her ballet teacher, who taught adult classes at a nearby college. Lydia arranged her own transfer to another high school out of district. Her parents arranged her transportation, and because her grades were good, never award winning good but good, she was allowed to skip some classes so she could cross the street and study ballet instead of study hall. By that time, she was taking ballet several hours a day, every day, and intense eight-hour day workshops in the summer. The minute Lydia entered that new high school, she changed her story because she was pretty and sweet and by now was slim and had a fashion sense. The new kids were drawn to her rather than repelled. In a heartbeat, she knew she never had to be a victim anymore and could be popular and accepted. She spotted girls she liked and sat with them not knowing they were at the popular table. Lydia's mother had taught her to sew years ago, since she made so many of her costumes, so by now she designed and made her own clothes. Sews was like a fashion show for her. With a graceful walk and bearing, the school corridors were her catwalk. Lydia went to the guidance counselor and argued her way into honors classes glad to write essays to prove her intelligence. It had never been acknowledged before, even though her mother had her IQ tested a few times and it was quite high. Lydia got involved in activities, since no one was throwing anything at her. She enjoyed joining choir, drama, and dance team. Boys now noticed her and didn't throw things at her, but her focus was her future. Her schedule was tight, since her mother had to pick her up and get her to ballet class. Lydia's grades improved, and she earned scholarships for college. 
She couldn't just hang out with kids as her life was disciplined, but she sure was happier. Upon graduation with honors at 17, Lydia had several college credits in dance already and scholarships to further her education. She had a clear plan and the Bible on NY Ballet Companies. The Compromise was a performing arts college in Seattle, so she went to school but also danced and got her degree. She did eventually wander to NY and also London. She traveled as a ballerina seeing the view on the train of the mountain, the rivers, the birds and blue skies of her world, not a reality. She danced on stages all over the place and had picked up many more dance forms over the years. She had not only moved those mountains, she had traveled them as well. Ten years after graduation, there was a reunion. Lydia had kept in touch with some of the popular girls, but it was a fascinating experience to actually be around everyone. It seemed most had never left their hometown. High school sweethearts married each other and moved a block from their parents' house, if not in the actual house itself. The jobs they had back in the day, flipping burgers or working at the checkout in the grocery store, were the same jobs they had today. The conversations now could have been merely left off from yesterday, not ten years later. Lydia had not lived in the area for years, in fact she won the farthest distance to travel, as she came from Europe. And she had won most likely to succeed, and indeed she proved that now. Outside of the popular girls, who had gone to sororities and married well and had careers, everyone else had stood still in time. As the slender ballerina dressed in a gown of white, Lydia stood out in the crowd. The boys, now men, that noticed her back then, noticed her now. The girl that was never pretty enough or clever enough to win any awards when she was young, won the biggest award now, a life well lived with success. She had moved the mountains and traveled them to follow her stars. A Nighttime Story by Hannah S. The days grew colder quickly in a small town called Little River. It snugly fits right next to beautiful flower fields and hills and Boston, Massachusetts. Sometimes during the winter, the snow would fall in the meadows, and a beautiful orange-pink sunset would cast its warmth all over the town. It is truly a sight to see. But this story does not take place in the meadows, but rather in a house all decorated for Christmas in the middle of a friendly suburban neighborhood. In this house lives a little brunette girl named Stella, her parents, and her grandmother, who came for the holidays, but her parents were out in the town that night, so it was just Stella and her grandmother. Thirteen-year-old Stella couldn't sleep, so she put on her favorite sweater and crept downstairs to eat a snack, hoping her grandmother wouldn't notice. Unfortunately for her, a sneeze tickled her nose as soon as she reached the pantry. She couldn't hold it back, so she awakened the house and alerted the grandmother of her presence downstairs. Stella. Grandma ambled into the kitchen to catch Stella red-handed in front of the pantry, holding a box of cookies. Dear, what are you doing up? She said gently. I can't sleep. Stella said sheepishly, and I wanted some cookies. Grandma laughed. Go have some cookies, I'll be on the couch. Okay. If you want a story, just ask me, all right. Yes, thank you, I want a story. I'm going to finish these cookies first. Sure thing, let me sit down. Grandma always told the best stories, and she told them whenever Stella couldn't sleep, they were action-packed with just the right amount of suspense, tragicness, and romance. Grandma always said she got them from reading something called Wattpad, but Stella didn't know what that was. She said never to read them because they were not age-appropriate for Stella, and she always said that she told the stories she read with an appropriate twist on them. The kitchen was filled with the warmth of the living room fireplace, 
sending a sense of peace and holiday magic all over the house. This was Stella's favorite time of year. The thick blankets on the couch, warm cookies, and happiness that came with Christmas were unbeatable. She finished her cookies, made some hot chocolate for story time, and cleaned up before hopping onto the couch right next to her grandmother. Ready for a story? She asked. Yep, I made hot chocolate for both of us too. Thank you, dear. Grandma took her mug from Stella and gently set it down on the table, and then they both hauled big blankets from the couch and bundled up. Grandma cleared her throat and said, This is the story of a Christmas time one year when I was a little girl just like you, not a Wattpad story. She chuckled, but a story from my own life about one of my best friends. Stella nodded. This was around 2023, and I was around 15 years old. Wow, that was so long ago. Like 80 years ago. Yes, correct. I was just about to go on Christmas vacation. It was the second to last day of school and we were watching a Christmas movie. Remember Est, my best friend? Is it the lady who came by yesterday with dark brown hair and cat eye glasses? Yes. Correct. She was one of my closest school friends and she's still my friend to this day. Isn't that amazing? Well, I want a friendship like that. I am very lucky for Est. She loved to have fun, and she partied a lot. We almost got arrested on an island vacation, but that's a tale for another day. Grandma chuckled, remembering the memories. Stella wanted to hear what happened on the island, but Grandma could only tell one story per night because then she got too tired. She always said that she was retired to be tired and lazy all day. Storytelling took a lot out of her. Anyway, back to the story. There was one boy in class that had a big crush on Est. His name was Leo, and everyone knew that he liked her except Est herself. Leo also happened to have what we called lots of rizzas, which was a shortened slang term for charisma. He had wavy hair and soft gray eyes. What's riz? Grandma laughed just as you guys have your own sling words, our generation had ours as well. For example, the term Riza could be used like this. That boy has lots of Riza or he rizzed her up. Oh, that's funny. Give me another example. We use the term sus as a shortened word for suspicious, usually used when someone said something that could be interpreted as something dirty. She sighed. So many people tried to make things people said into something dirty. It was annoying. Stella laughed. I'm sorry that happened. That day in the classroom, nobody was paying attention to the movie. The teacher wasn't inside with us. I think she was talking to another teacher outside. I remember a group of girls were in the corner making TikToks. What's TikTok? Oh, I forgot you don't know this stuff. When it first blew up, the main thing about it was dancing to sped up music. Grandma cackled. And later on it was also a place to get pop culture news and see what was trending. I remember making so many TikToks. It was such a huge platform. If you didn't know what TikTok was, you were probably either a small child or what we called boomers which were elderly people born between 1946 and 1964. Grandma chuckled. How the tables have turned now. It's okay, Grandma. I can teach you how to stay relevant in this age. Please do. Anyway, Est and Leo were similar in lots of ways. Both Leo and Est liked to party, were bold and outgoing, and got into minor trouble here and there at school. They both had soft sides and, despite getting into trouble sometimes, were very intellectual. It made perfect sense that Leo would have a crush on Est and a big one. It helped that Leo had four classes out of six with her, so they hung out a lot. Grandma then paused to recollect the memories, and Stella readjusted her position on the couch. 
She could fall asleep right then and there listening to Grandma's comfortable and joyous voice, accompanied by the heat from the fireplace. The warmth felt like a big hug and it radiated everywhere. Continue the story, Grandma. Oh, yes. I remember now. The day before, I had asked Est what she thought of Leo, and Est had only said that she liked having him around. I was willing to take a gamble and say that she did have a crush on him based on that one statement. Grandma laughed out loud. Did she have a crush on him? I'll tell you later on. Grandma. Shh. Grandma chuckled. I'll reveal it soon. I then told Est that Leo had a crush on her and she didn't believe me. No matter how many times I told her that everybody at school knew, she still didn't believe me. He's just my friend, everyone knows that. I was determined to prove it, preferably before Christmas vacation, so that meant I had to get Leo to confess straight to her face before the break. I had Leo's friend's contacts, and through them, I got Leo's contact. It took some convincing, but he agreed after 35 minutes. I thought it would take longer than that, honestly. The confession would take place during the fourth period, the period before lunch. Grandma then paused, sipping her hot chocolate and taking her time. Really, Grandma? You decided to pause right now at this point in the story? Stella said with an exasperated smile. Oh, come on. You don't think it was just a coincidence that I paused now? Grandma said grinning. All right then, let's finish. I entered the fourth period and saw Leo and his friends whispering in the corner. I went over to them to make sure he didn't chicken out, and luckily he didn't. He was just going to wait until a little later. That seemed a little skeptical to me, but I didn't want to be pushy about it. Finally, after half the class went by, the teacher was out of the room, and everyone separated into groups, not paying attention to the movie. Leo stood up with his friends teasing and shouting next to him and walked over to Est, who was sitting next to me. We were on our phones and playing a game when Est looked over at Leo and smiled. Oh, hi Leo. Wanna play this game with me and Lucy? Some people then and there started staring at us. But finally, Leo said the words, I have a crush on you. Now the whole class was silent. I could tell Leo was bracing himself for potential rejection, but finally, S looked up and grinned. Well, me too, idiot. The whole class erupted into chaos. Leo's friends were cheering next to him. The girls were surrounding S, and we all just made a bunch of noise. Oh, the noise. I can't remember what exactly was said, but I know for sure we were quite loud at that moment. Grandma said with amusement. Ah, oh, that's a happy ending then. What happened to the two? Grandma smiled. Est is married now. Do you know her husband's name? No, what is it? Leo. Stella's jaw dropped. Est married Leo? Did she meet her husband in high school? That's so cool. It is amazing indeed. They both had lots of maturing to do before marriage, but it is still very sweet. Stella was sleepy now. She said goodbye to her grandmother and headed up the stairs, warm and happy from the cookies, the fire, and the story of how her grandmother's best friend's first love was her true love. Hitting a Rainbow by Peter Nodin the lady said many kind things to Bernadette. She told Bernadette, Dear Bernadette, this is going to happen in the world. There will come a day in the future when all humans, animals, and all living creatures including insects will think the same thought at exactly the same moment. This will happen all across the world, and at that moment something beautiful will happen and it will bring happiness to all of us. But, Bernadette wanted to ask a question, but to her amazement, the lady disappeared. She went and told Father Hearn in the monastery close by, and he scoffed at her and said, See, 
I told you and everyone that we live in a holographic universe, and holograms are arriving to confuse us. Oh, yes, I know, Father, protested Bernadette, but that is hardly a reason to ignore the idea the lady had of a shared thought coming to rescue us from planetary confusion. You go ahead, said Father Hearn. I am going off to play golf, that's my idea of heaven. Anyway, Father, respectfully, I am going to go to tell my Auntie Bidgie about this and see what she thinks about it. Bernadette's Auntie Bidgie was her favorite person on Earth, and she had been Bernadette's best interpreter of reality for all of her 11 years on the planet Earth. Her real name was Bridget, but she liked when Bernadette called her Bidgie. And as soon as Bernadette told her what had happened, Bridget said, it is the thought that will bring happiness, not any action that we take. It will be a view of reality that will bring happiness into our minds. Bernadette gazed admiringly at her auntie. She was 80 years old and her eyes were a bright blue. Her hair was gray and she always wore the most beautiful clothes. She frequently dressed like a gypsy and that was because she had lived once the gypsy lifestyle. I lived next door to her auntie and I too was barely 11 years old when Bernadette told me this. I had been a constant companion for her since the age of six when my mother went off on a tour to San Francisco because she wanted to catch up on her prayers and left me with my grandmother. In our family, we prayed together a lot because an angel had reputedly told the owner of the bakery across the street from my grandmother's house that the family that prays together stays together. I was allowed to ramble around the village as long as I visited several old women who were living alone, which I did because I found them interesting to listen to and because they also gave me lots of really nice treaty food to eat like apple and raisin pies, sweet potatoes, frazzle biscuits and creamy jelly peach pies, and date puddings. In our village, elderly women were very spiritually inclined and often looked out their doorways at the sky and said they wished an angel would come and visit them and tell them how long before they would embark on a trip to heaven. They regarded themselves as holy souls. They never suggested that it was only their souls that would make the trip. They were forever hinting that they would be in heaven having tea in a tea shop there and when I would go there at the end of my time on earth they would look out for me and we could hang out in heaven's tea parlor and feel God's love in our hearts we ate cookies together. My gypsy friend, Bernadette's Aunt Bridget, was only one of these wonderful people. There was Katrin who owned one cow who was living in a field near her house but when the cow needed to be milked, Katrin's friend Seamus would walk her cow to her front door and ring her doorbell. Then Katrin would open the door and the cow would come into the house and through the dining room to the back door which opened out into a yard that had a stable in it where the cow would hang out until it was milked and then go off to sleep on her bed of straw there for the night. Then there was MTS, Kenban who was rich and owned a few mills and a store that sold wheat and other flour. She did not need to work because she had a manager and a stepson who ran the whole show. All she had to do was sit in her beautiful sitting room at a small table and play solitaire. She called the game, Patience, because she explained to me that she was waiting for the right cards to show up in her hand every day and that way she would be happy. And then there was Miss L, and then there was Sis M. I could go on forever about these fascinating old ladies who wanted me to come and chat with them anytime during the daytime because they wanted me to grow up to be a happy person. I wanted to be happy. I loved them. My own mother was a saintly woman who would light candles in our home and say that the flames from them were seen in heaven they were like light signals to the angels that they would be welcome in our home. I wanted the angels to come too because I liked the pictures of angels I had seen. They looked nice. And then I heard that I had my very own angel, who was with me all the time, even while I was asleep. My mom, 
whose name was Pearly, taught me how to cross my heart with my arms when I was falling asleep saying this was a signal to my guardian angel that I loved her and that I appreciated her being there watching over me. When Bernadette told me the story of the lady telling her the whole world was destined to share the same thought I decided that I would go and talk to Father Hearn at the golf course. I was out playing golf and standing on the fourth tee where I often sliced my drive out of bounds onto a railway track. The only way I thought I could stop myself from doing that was by saying aloud, God, keep my tee shot in bounds and land my golf ball onto the fairway, please. Father Ahern came up behind me and said, My dear child, don't let fairy stories about how close God is to you make you go on a wild goose chase for your life. But Father, I said, aren't we all forgiven and nobody is going to be punished or lost? We are all going to be gathered together and made into stars. Heaven is a real place and all of the minds in the universe are gathered there emitting energy that heals and makes everyone feel as if they are being held by loving arms. Nobody is going to feel their body is the enemy. Everyone is going to feel a warm flame around their hearts and the ability to float through the air without worrying about what they might collide with. We will be able to wave to each other and share the space. We will be able to write messages with clouds and rush to help anyone who calls us. Happy memories will be shared in beautiful gardens where lovely seats will be for anyone to sit on and enjoy the sky and the sound of water fountains. Girls will be girls happily and men will be men happily and harmoniously always looking for ways to share their natural gifts with the women who are their constant companions and there are golf courses and tennis courts for people who want to play perfectly and score their best game scores all the time. Okay, okay, let's keep playing, I will go first, said Father Ahern. He took one practice swing and wham, hit a fabulous drive right down the middle of the par 5 fourth hole. Oh my god, that is the best drive I have ever had here, he said. Let me see if I can outdo you. I said, looking at the heavens, where a rainbow had appeared. Hit the rainbow young lad, and I will believe anything you tell me about us all being one. I hit my tee shot and my ball went a record distance up the fairway and bounded close to father's ball and then hit it. Wow you've made a believer out of me young man. You did not hit the rainbow, but you sure showed me how much I have to learn. And that is how we proved that Burndadit's predictions were true. Predictions were true.